and welcome to From the EBPL Archives, Encore Presentations from the East Brunswick Public Library. I am your host, Melissa Hozik. This event was presented as part of our Just for the Health of It initiative. Just for the Health of It is a proprietary health literacy program developed by the East Brunswick Public Library to promote health literacy in Middlesex County. To learn more, visit justforthehealthofit.org. Now, enjoy the program. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for today's Lunch and Learn with the doctors on managing the common side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. My name is Kathy Churn, and I am a consumer health librarian at East Brunswick Public Library. Today's program is brought to you by Regional Cancer Care Associates Central Jersey Division, Princeton Radiation Oncology, and the Libraries Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Today's speakers are Dr. J. Y. Lee, Radiation Oncologist at Princeton Radiation Oncology, and Dr. Philip D. Reed, Medical Oncologist and Hematologist at Regional Cancer Care Associates Central Jersey. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded. Please keep your microphones muted and your webcams off. The recording will be available at ebpl.org slash YouTube. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. The doctors will answer questions at the end of the talk. The doctors presenting will not be able to offer personal medical advice to attendees during this program. And without further ado, I shall turn things over to the doctors. All right, thanks. So uh, my name is Dr. Jay Lee. I'm a radiation oncologist with Princeton on uh, Radiation Oncology. Um, today, you know, both myself and Dr. Reed, um, we are basically going to talk about some of the side effects that people can expect with radiation treatment for uh, various types of cancers. And uh, we'll split it up roughly into a um, portion about radiation side effects and then a second portion about more of the uh, chemotherapy side effects. But really, um, these, these uh, treatment modalities, they're being used more and more commonly together, and sometimes these side effects can overlap. But just to, um, to, to sort of uh, organize things, uh, we've sort of broken it up that way. So why talk about side effects? It's really because uh, it's a major part of our goal as cancer doctors. So obviously, when we're treating cancer, we care a lot about efficacy, meaning how successful are we at being able to cure the disease that we're, we're treating. But a second major component of this is trying to reduce any adverse side effects that might occur from the treatments themselves. And another important point to keep in mind is that as efficacy and cancer survival improves, these uh, considerations about side effects and complications, they become increasingly more important. So today for the radiation portion, I'll talk a little bit about what exactly radiation is and why it is that uh, side effects occur from treatments. And then we'll talk about some of the more common cancers treated with radiation and some of the side effects that patients can expect. So what is radiation? Radiation really refers to a broad spectrum. Uh, and here we, we have a kind of a representation of the electromagnetic spectrum. You have um, things like radio waves and microwaves here kind of on the low energy spectrum. And when we talk about medical radiation therapy, we're really talking about these high energy x-rays. Um, and these are what's used to treat cancers. And on a molecular level, uh, what radiation does is it really does two things. One is when it enters the cell, it can cause direct damage in the DNA molecules themselves, or it can interact with water molecules that create these free radicals that then cause indirect damage to molecules like DNA. Normal cells, they're able to repair this damage much better than cancer cells can and organs, which are made up of many, many cells, they usually replace their cells under normal circumstances. But cancer cells, they have uh, mechanisms of repair that are damaged. They're not able to repair this uh, DNA damage as readily as normal cells. 
So the side effects of radiation therapy, it really has to do with what are the organs that are nearby where we're treating. So for prostate cancer, we think a lot about the rectum, the bladder, and the bowel. These are the organs that are, are nearby. And for the breast cancer, we think a lot about side effects to the chest, uh, the skin, the lungs, and the heart. And also when we think about side effects, we uh, think about them in terms of early versus delayed side effects. So early side effects are things that patients can experience during the weeks of treatment and delayed are generally things that come about after all the treatment is done. And they share some, they're, they're distinguished by a few different characteristics. For the most part, early side effects, they tend to be more common, they tend to be relatively mild, and more importantly, they're temporary. And delayed side effects, on the other hand, they fortunately are more rare, but they can be severe when they occur and they're long lasting. So the philosophy of treating these side effects and managing them changes somewhat. So for early side effects, we focus a lot on treating these, getting you through uh, some of these transient issues. And for long-term side effects, we focus a lot of our attention and effort on preventing them. So let's start with prostate cancer. So during the course of radiation for prostate cancer, patients really experience three things. One is fatigue. There may be some minor skin changes. And the second issue is that uh, urination becomes a little bit more um, frequent. There can be a weaker stream. There may be some burning as well. Um, and third, the rectum, if it becomes irritated, can cause more frequent bowel movements, perhaps some more urgency, uh, to, the, to the bowel movements, looseness and discomfort. So when you track these different uh, side effects over time, and we're looking at the time from the start of radiation from one week all the way to 18 weeks, what we see is that patients generally have grade one or very mild side effects that come up very gradually during the weeks of treatment, and then it goes away gradually. Grade two side effects tend to be things that are a little bit more noticeable, maybe require some medications to help manage. And grade three are some of the more serious complications that can occur. And these fortunately tend to be quite rare. So what do we do when we see these early urinary side effects? Number one, sometimes it's just careful observation. As, as we saw, a lot of these kind of come up gradually and then they go away gradually. If they don't cause much of a bother, it's really, um, you know, we try to follow sort of a, a minimalist approach. Occasionally, we might require things like anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen or alpha blockers. And again, a lot of these side effects, they overlap with some of the side effects that patients get with urinary tract infections. So we always have to keep that in the back of our mind and treat those as necessary. What about rectal side effects? Again, when we look at uh, the distribution of the severity of side effects, for the most part, they tend to be grade one and mild. And these different lines, they only, they just refer to different treatment schedules. Some of these are more long, some of these are shorter, but in general, most patients have this kind of mild side effect profile that comes and goes. In grade two, you can see here, and grade three, really just uh, barely visible here at the bottom. And so rectal side effects, again, uh, we, we can manage them by careful observation. Occasionally, um, you know, dietary changes may be necessary to help manage with some of the uh, looser stools. We can use medicines like antidiarrheal medications and, again, more anti-inflammatory agents if needed. So we talked about the early side effects. What about the long-term urinary or bowel complications? Again, these tend to be much uh, rarer, which, which is good, but they can be more serious. And these include things like radiation cystitis or urethritis. This is an inflammatory reaction that can occur at the bladder or in the urethra. And when this occurs, the symptoms are generally burning. There may be a little bleeding uh, and pain. There could be uh, urethral strictures as well. So this is a narrowing of the urethra, making urination more difficult. 
and occasionally may require surgical intervention to help uh, restore regular flow. And the same inflammatory reactions can occur in, in the rectum as well, something called radiation proctitis, giving rise to chronically loose bowel movements, perhaps some rectal bleeding. But when we look at the distribution of even long-term side effects, fortunately, they tend to be relatively rare and mild as well. So here we have all bowel side effects at various time points from six months to 60 months after treatment. And these bars represent different grades of toxicity. So the vast majority of patients, they have grade zero or no toxicity. And a very small fraction of patients experience grade one mild toxicities and a very, very small amount of patients experience more serious issues. And that's kind of the distribution for bowel issues. And for urinary issues, it tends to be even smaller. So what can we do to further decrease the risk of long-term complications from prostate radiation? One of the ways that we manage this is by installing this hydrogel material. This is sort of like a gelatin cushion that's positioned between the prostate and the rectum wall. And what it does is it helps push the rectal wall away from the prostate and away from the radiation. It's delivered by a thin needle that goes through the perineal skin and it stays in place for three months. These are MRI uh, pictures of, of what happens. So here on the left, this is the prostate and the rectum prior to any intervention. You can see that the rectal wall is tucked up right against the prostate. And this is that hydrogel spacer that positions itself right between those two structures. And then six months later, um, the spacer basically is dissolved away. So between three to six months, that's, that uh, hydrogel dissipates and it's, it's basically gone. And what it can do for us is when we look at the dose to the rectum and we're looking at increasingly higher doses uh, delivered to the rectum, in patients without the spacer and black bars, you see that some amount of the rectum is exposed to uh, radiation. And as you get to higher doses, a smaller amount of that rectum is exposed. But in the presence of the spacer, because it's further away from the prostate, that dose that the rectum sees goes down dramatically. And this translates to an improvement in bowel quality of life. So control patients three years after their treatments have a small reduction in bowel quality of life whereas patients with the spacer are more likely to preserve their quality of life. Another way that we can use to further decrease any long-term complications is the use of different types of radiation, such as proton therapy. So conventional radiation is pictured here on the left where a beam enters the body through one side of, of the body and it exits out the other side. With protons, this uses charged particles and it behaves differently in the body. It comes in one direction, all the energy is deposited where we want it to, and then there's no exit dose. So as a result, we're able to achieve radiation plants that deliver lower doses to surrounding structures. So this is sort of a representative example of what we can do with proton therapy for prostate cancer. And here in the red, this is where the high dose radiation is concentrated around the prostate. And then surrounding that, there's sort of this low dose uh, around the different structures like the rectum and the bladder uh, here. But with proton therapy, the distribution is, is tighter. Uh, we're able to spare a lot of the, um, the surrounding organs uh, from treatments. Sorry, we had a little brown out here. Here we are. Um, okay. And... Um, the use of proton therapy, it's being uh, looked at in a large randomized trial right now, of which uh, we're a part of. Um, and we're looking at whether the reduction in the dose to uh, these different structures lead to improvements in quality of life. So let's move on to breast cancer. So when we're treating the breast with radiation, the side effects tend to be different. And so here it's primarily fatigue and maybe some skin issues like redness, perhaps some peeling and pain, analogous to what you'd get with a sunburn. 
Uh, very rarely patients can experience things like lung irritation, maybe a little dry cough and esophageal irritation where they have a scratchiness or a little discomfort when they swallow. But when you ask patients, what are the different side effects that you experience with breast pain and bother? Um, this is what we see. On a scale of zero to 10, most patients report a pain level of about two and a half. So nothing too dramatic. And you can see here that about three quarters of patients report no bother with symptoms like itching or stinging or hurting. And about a quarter, 20 to 25% of patients experience some frequent bother with these symptoms. So the management for these early side effects tends to be things like exercise to help minimize fatigue, moisturization with lotions on the skin, anti-inflammatory agents, maybe topical steroids, and film protectants. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So mimetazone is a steroid cream, and this was tested in a randomized trial where half the patients received a placebo cream and the other half received the steroid cream. And what we see is that the, um, the score of, of skin bothersome symptoms, they tend to be lower in patients who receive the steroid cream. And this is another way that we can help manage. It is by the use of something called a Mepatel film. So this is kind of a thin transparent film. It's a uh, dressing that's applied to the skin and stays in place during the weeks of treatment. In the presence of that Mepatel film in the black bars, the, the skin scores, the toxicity scores tend to be much lower than compared to patients who don't have the film. But again, a lot of these interventions, some patients may need them and some patients may not. It's not really a one size fits all situation. But what about the delayed side effects after breast radiation? So these are some of the more feared complications after radiation. And I wanted to make this clear that for the most part, the serious complications after breast radiation tend to be very rare. They include things like pneumonitis, uh, in, inflammatory reaction that occurs in the lungs, perhaps leads to a dry cough and requires steroids to get rid of. That happens in about 1% of patients. Lymphedema or swelling, this tends to be more of a surgical risk. So removal of those lymph nodes impairs fluid um, drainage from the arm. And the addition of radiation adds a few percentage points, but not much to that risk. Cardiac disease, uh, this is obviously one of the more serious complications, but when we look at the data, the excess risk that a non-smoker patient would experience with radiation is only about 0.3%. So it's not zero, but very, very low. And things like secondary malignancies, a second cancer like lung cancer from the radiation, again, that risk is very low in non-smokers. So this is a... Um, a uh, study that looked at patient satisfaction scores with their cosmetic outcomes after breast radiation. And depending on whether it was the doctor who was rating the outcomes or the patients, for the most part, there are some slight differences, but about 80% of patients report either an excellent or good cosmetic outcome. And in terms of their satisfaction, a vast majority of patients are totally satisfied with breast radiation. And then this is an important slide that looks at the two most uh, feared complications long-term after breast radiation. So here on the left, we're looking at lung cancer death risk. And here on the right, we're looking at cardiac disease risk. So these are split up into two groups. One is in smokers and the other is in non-smokers. So in smokers, their risk of dying from lung cancer at 30 years after their radiation is about 9%. And this does increase somewhat with the addition of radiation. But in non-smokers, as you, as you can see, that risk is very low regardless of whether you receive radiation or not. Same pattern that we see with ischemic heart disease where in smokers, that risk is a little bit higher, but in non-smokers, the additional risk that's brought on by the radiation itself is actually quite low. So those studies, uh, that data has been generated usually without um, the use of some of these other techniques that we use these days. So um, there are 
there are changes that we use now to sort of increase the distance between the breast and the heart to further decrease the dose delivered to the heart. And there are technologically advanced radiation techniques that we can use to further drive down that dose. So one of these is called deep inspiration breath hold. So this is a device that looks like this, where the patients basically breathe through this tube and they wear goggles that show a tracing of their breathing pattern. And we coach them to stay within a certain range of their lung capacity. And what happens with this device is that as you get more lung filling, the heart falls away from the chest wall and away from the radiation shown here in red. And as a result, the dose to important structures like the heart, the left ventricle, important blood vessels, they all go down uh, dramatically. Another way that we can use to decrease heart dose is by positioning changes. So uh, we've heard a lot about prone positioning recently in the news for treatment of COVID patients in the ICU. We can use the same positioning where patients are lying on their stomach to pull their breast tissue away from the heart and uh, reduce dose to these important structures. One of the uh, advanced radiation techniques that we can use is IMRT. So this shows a conventional pattern where a small sliver of the heart is exposed to the radiation. And uh, sometimes we may use techniques like IMRT to drive dose away from that area. But again, not all patients require these techniques. And finally, we talked about proton therapy for prostate cancer. It can also be used for patients with breast cancer. And in certain cases where patients might have bilateral reconstructive surgeries, where we have to cover all of the regional lymph nodes, sometimes proton therapy gives us a big advantage in being able to minimize dose to the heart. And again, just like there is for prostate cancer, we have a large randomized trial comparing photon radiation and proton radiation for breast cancer patients, and we're an active participant in that trial. So the take-home points from this portion, really what I want you to walk away from this is that early side effects associated with prostate radiation or breast radiation, they tend to be common, they're mild, and they're temporary. And there's various ways that we can manage these different issues. Delayed side effects, they tend to be a little bit more serious and permanent, but fortunately, they're quite rare. And I showed you some of the ways that we deliver radiation to minimize uh, any long-term complications. But really, the most important point is that every patient is different, and some patients may require none of these, and some patients may require many of these interventions. So it's really important to talk to your doctor uh, who will know all the details of your case and um, you know, make the right recommendations. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Reed. Okay, great. So I'm Dr. Reed, medical oncology, and um, I'd like to go through uh, the medical oncologist's take on managing uh, common side effects that are seen with um, the use of uh, medications to fight cancer. Uh, we used to simply be able to say chemotherapy, however, many of the treatment strategies that we use employ medications that are not exactly uh, classical chemotherapy, but they all have uh, the purpose of um, helping individuals fight uh, cancer and improve the quality of their lives. Um, so I'd like to go through um, uh, some basic recommendations we would have in uh, for patients and their uh, caregivers um, on how to manage uh, their disease and get through uh, their treatments with as little side effects as possible. So uh, I'd like to identify strategies, improve your partnership and communication with your healthcare team, help you develop a plan for your cancer therapy, and gain information about cancer treatments and their side effects. We'll also go through some simple strategies to prevent and manage some of these uh, uh, common side effects. So uh, an important point is that each cancer um, is, an in, is uh, taking place in an individual. And uh, so is 
each cancer treatment plan. So the cancer treatment is unique for each uh, individual. And within the um, treatment plan, the different cancer fighting drugs that are used, they can cause uh, different side effects. Two people with the same cancer diagnosis may have very different treatment plans. And due to differences in cancer stage and tumor biology, they may go through their disease in very different um, uh, ways. So I know that it's a natural tendency to ask your friends or loved ones or uh, look around and um, find someone who has a similar diagnosis, but it's becoming more and more uh, true that treatment is very individualized. So you should be cautious in extrapolating the experience of someone else who has say a lung cancer to your own experience because your treatment plans may be very different, not only based on stage, which is how much cancer is in your body, but also various um, uh, differences in the biology of the cancers, but you should only define by looking at your particular cancer. So it's important to know your individual uh, treatment plan in order to anticipate and take control of your side effects. So communicating with the healthcare team. Very important, write questions down before you go to uh, the doctor and uh, bring the written questions to the appointment to speak with the healthcare team. Um, if allowed, bring a friend or family member with you to take notes or ask to have someone listen in on the treatment plan, uh, at least via uh, speakerphone. Now this has all changed a bit in the current pandemic, but it is true that a second set of ears is often very helpful and certainly at least having written notes you can refer to back to in the, in the future. You know, we're very aware that um, often with the first visit, you go in and the doctor you know, sits down with you for you know, 40 minutes to an hour. And afterwards you hear you know, something like something, 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 cancer, uh, we'll treat it, something, something, and the word cancer again. So it's, we are um, very cognizant that it's uh, a lot of information can be presented very quickly and it's very difficult to process it all at once, particularly when you're very anxious about the information that's being provided to you. So keep a written diary of the treatment medications you are currently receiving. And uh, in, a, in order to help um, your own path and in order to anticipate what's gonna happen, ask a health team what side effects to expect and importantly, when uh, they may occur. So uh, potential side effects of cancer and cancer therapy. I'm gonna run through um, relatively quickly um, management of a few different um, problems. Infection, fatigue, nausea, pain, uh, diarrhea and constipation and uh, touch on uh, hair loss as well. So we can get to um, the end to have some uh, questions answered. So infection. Um, very for foremost in many people's mind when they're undergoing uh, cancer therapy. Uh, some treatments that we use destroy white blood cells, which leads to neutropenia. Uh, neutropenia is a decrease in the number of white blood cells that fight bacterial infections. Low white cell count can lead to treatment delays or dose reductions. And is also a significant factor um, in determining whether or not someone may, have it, someone may develop an infection. Now, typically, the white cell count is lowest about seven to 12 days after chemotherapy. And it is important to you know, keep some track of when you were last treated and with what drugs to anticipate when you might have an issue with infection. You know, commonly uh, patients will get treated and they go home and they have a slight temperature uh, elevation you know, within 24 to 40 hours of their treatment. And they'll call back concern about the fever and the elevated temperature. You know, at that point, it's unlikely to be due to infection because your immune system is still, you know, in pretty good shape for a couple of days after each treatment. And therefore, uh, you know, when you call in, one of the things we'll ask is when you were last treated. And in what's going on in our minds is we're estimating what's going on with your white count. Um, because right after treatment, you're usually okay. A week or so later is when you might see a decrease in your white cell count to the point where it might be uh, low enough to really increase the risk of infection. Now, the two things going on, both the, the chemotherapy is decreasing the white cell count, but 
Uh, chemotherapy can also injure uh, tissue membranes. That in does increase the risk of infection because your skin and the lining of your mouth are very good barriers that prevents organism from getting into your system and causing the problem. Chemotherapy damages that. And that is probably one of the major reasons that patients with low counts and or on chemotherapy can uh, have an increased risk of infection. Uh, cancers um, or tumors in your body also do not have a good barrier to infection. So neutropenia plus infection can be a life-threatening complication. So how do, you, what, how do we think about it? How do we help you manage uh, fever and neutropenia? So definition of fever. It's a single oral temperature of 101 Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius or 100.3 um, uh, disease uh, Fahrenheit for one hour. What's well, definition of neutropenia? So the absolute neutrophil counter, A and C, is something that we measure relatively frequently during your therapy. It's less than 500 cells per millimeter cubed. Uh, normal A and C is about it's really about 2,000, I put 4,000 there, but it's about 2,000 to 8,000 cells uh, per millimeter cubed. And the ANC is calculated automatically on uh, most routine uh, CBC, which is complete blood cell count. You'll be considered to be neutropenic if the ANC, the absolute neutrophil count, is expected to be less than 500. And I say expected because it may be okay that day, but Depending on how far you out, how far you out from your chemotherapy, you may anticipate your counts may drop. So sometimes we will treat people even if their counts are okay if they're going in the wrong direction. Now, although we're concerned about fever neutropenia, it is not guaranteed to happen that if you have a low white cell count, you develop an infection. So the incidence of fever neutropenia is less likely to occur with solid cancers. For instance, about 5% of risk per cycle for patients receiving treatment for breast, for breast cancer. That's standard adjuvant therapy for breast cancer. There's a higher likelihood for people who have liquid tumors. That would be uh, leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, going up to um, uh, AML, which is acute myelogenous leukemia, where we sort of expect people to develop a fever at some point during therapy. And for many reasons, uh, those patients are actually admitted in the hospital in anticipation of this. So just to show you what we're looking at from the um, uh, physician standpoint, um, this is a uh, complete blood cell count of one of my patients. And, and let's point out a few things. Look at the WBC, which is the white blood cell count, which the range here goes from 5,000 to 10,000. This um, person's uh, white count is uh, 1.7 or 1,700. And the neutrophil count, absolute neutrophil count here is given as granulocyte number. It's the same thing as the ANC is 300. So this person meets the criteria for absolute um, uh, neutropenia and the normal range, again, of the absolute neutrophil count is about 2,500 to 8,000. Um, this person is also slightly anemic. Now, you may look at this and be very concerned, but uh, this individual actually um, is not ill, is not receiving any chemotherapy, and this is their baseline white cell count. Uh, um, you know, this person's in their mid-20s and have lived their life with a white cell count that is... Uh, you know, 20% of what we would typically see, and they're doing okay. Um, you know, over the past six years has required antibiotics maybe two or three times. The point I'm making is that it's not only a decrease in the white cell count, that's the issue. It's also the injury to um, the linings of your uh, intestines and mouth and airways that uh, really increases the risk of infection. So what are the signs and symptoms of infection? Um, just quickly, um, guys are familiar with these, uh, fever, chills, sweating, redness, rash, headache or stiff neck, sore throat, sinus pain or eric, uh, difficulty of urination, uh, diarrhea, pain with bowel movement. Um, these are um, uh, symptoms that would prompt you to, or should prompt you to call and request um, assistance. 
So when you call, what will be the person you reach, either one of the, nur the uh, a nurse practitioner or a physician will ask a few simple questions. Um, most probably, what are you receiving in terms of treatment and when? And that was the whole point of going through the timing of the development of neutropenia. Because when they're speaking with you, they're estimating how likely are you to run into trouble if you have these symptoms and the temperature. The more likely you are to be neutropenic, the more likely you are to make uh, an intervention such as starting antibiotics, which may be the simplest thing, um, or just having you check your temperature a little bit later on uh, in the day and call back up to admitting you to the hospital for um, uh, intravenous antibiotics. So how do we prevent uh, infections? Um, obviously avoid cuts, um, wear gloves while gardening or uh, washing dishes to help prevent injury to your skin. Because again, when the skin is interrupted, that's when uh, you provide a portal of entry for um, uh, pathogens. If you do injure yourself, clean the site well, apply disinfectant. If the injury becomes uh, swollen and red, um, that may be a sign of infection and you would at that point uh, contact your physician. Many of these um, interventions also are being recommended because of the current uh, environment. Wash your hands, avoid crowds and people who are obviously ill. Wash fruits and vegetables well before eating. Avoid touching or eating raw and cooked meat, uh, chicken eggs or seafood. We're not saying you can't eat vegetables and fruit. It's just that they should be washed and or cooked. Um, idea being you don't want whatever is on the outside of um, uh, the fruits and vegetables to get inside your body. Okay. We'll move on to fatigue. Um, fatigue is probably the most common complaint of cancer patients. Described as feeling tired, exhausted, and worn out. Uh, often more intense than has been experienced previously. Uh, fatigue due to chemotherapy appears and then improves in relation to the time from treatment. Uh, management relies on anticipating this sort of roller coaster effect of the fatigue, and um, uh, really, you have to adjust your behavior in anticipation of the fatigue. There are some techniques to decrease it, but we really would emphasize uh, making a plan uh, to uh, allow yourself to be tired when you're tired, but then keep active uh, when you're not. Tips to conserve your energy um, ask others for help. Set realistic goals that you can accomplish uh, for the day. If you know that you're really tired three days after you receive your treatment and that lasts for two more days, you know, don't plan to remodel your home you know, in that time. Um, uh, set more realistic goals for that time period. And when you begin to feel better, you can uh, move ahead. Uh, you identify the time of the day when you have the most energy and consider scheduling and doing things during this window. Tips to restore your energy. Should you rest or remain active? Now, this has been an active question in oncology, and it turns out that uh, it's best to remain um, uh, moderately active. Uh, following uh, exercise regimen um, does help with controlling fatigue. Moderate activity, walking, uh, getting on a treadmill at a, a slow to moderate pace, uh, for 20 minutes or so, three or four times a week, um, significantly improves fatigue in multiple clinical trials, even more so than medications that actually are designed to increase your energy level. In fact, it's probably the most consistent thing that both in that increases um, the subjective sense that your fatigue has decreased um, and also it improves mood. Um, Again, do take time to have short naps, but no longer than 30 minutes during the day and aim to get a good night's sleep. Sort of um, true uh, uh, recommendations for a happy life. Anyway, uh, chemo brain. So there's no more complicated uh, term for this that we use in oncology. Um, it's changes in memory and thinking ability or difficulty learning new things uh, referred to as chemo brain. Um, it's real, um, you know, learn to forgive yourself if you're more forgetful. If you have, it takes you a bit longer to do tasks that you were able to accomplish before. Um, it's a real effect. Um, it's not fully understood. It does decrease over time away from chemotherapy. 
But again, you should begin to set realistic goals for yourself that you don't feel uh, frustrated. Um, don't multitask, focus on one thing at a time and this will help you avoid feeling frustrated. Eliminate distractions when you're uh, trying to do something, whenever you're tasked to accomplish, um, have conversation in quiet places so you can concentrate on the person who's speaking with you. And organize your surroundings to keep things like keys or glasses in a designated place. Use a planner, um, mark important appointments on the calendar, uh, mark down when you last received treatment, um, write down the names of your treatment drugs, even if you can't pronounce them and you call and ask for help, you can at least spell out the word and or you know, um, pronounce them as phonetically as you can. Uh, I cannot emphasize enough how much easier it is to deal with someone who knows what they are receiving in terms of treatment. we very commonly will um, get a phone call and uh, they will say that I have cancer and, uh, and I got chemo last week and can no longer um, explain exactly which chemotherapy regimen they received. Now, with time we can you know, sort of suss out what is being asked of us and in what context, but it's best to have that written down when you, when you seek assistance. So again, make appointments and plan activities to coincide with times when your concentration is at its best. There is a roller coaster effect with this as well. You will have uh, times when concentration is more difficult than others, and you sort of plan around that. The symptom will typically improve and then resolve with time away from treatment, although it may take um, uh, sometimes uh, weeks to months to do so. Moving on to uh, nausea, though well, we are being a little short on time. Um, so nausea, uh, not all treatments cause nausea, not all cancer treatments cause nausea, not all nausea due to side effects of uh, cancer therapy. Some nausea can occur um, due to the effects of the cancer itself. Okay? So some nausea is from the uh, manifestation of the cancer in your body and just running through some of these things that can cause nausea and some of the treatments we have. Excessive secretions for head and neck cancer, ascites, which is a fluid buildup in the abdomen, anorexia, which is loss of appetite from the cancer itself. And that can be helped with um, uh, medications like lanzapine and megase that can increase appetite. And uh, cannabinoids is a general term for um, marijuana and marijuana derivatives. Antidepressants can help with nausea in some cases. Anticipatory nausea, which is where you feel queasy before you go in for therapy, uh, that can be actually treated with, with uh, anti-anxiety medications. I know the cause of nausea such as brain um, injury from cancer in the brain can be treated with radiation and uh, steroids. Um, in general, you'd wanna know what the plan is for managing the nausea um, um, before you're exposed to any medication that might uh, trigger it. Um, most of our treatment regimens already have anti-nausea medications built in, so it automatically is given when you receive your treatment. And they're typically administered right before the chemotherapy drug is administered. Uh, if you have medications for home, fill those medications uh, prescribed um, before you start your treatment. Um, if you become nauseous at you know, 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. and you want to struggle to find a 24-hour pharmacy to fill your prescription or ask for the prescription at that time. Now, this should happen in our, what we call a chemotherapy instruction session that happens before you start treatment. But um, if it did not happen, certainly ask the nurses when you're being treated. Um, but they have treatment, you can eat a light meal or snack a few hours before you receive therapy. If you are nauseous, um, in addition to using the medications you'd be prescribed, uh, break up your meals. Um, what you try to do is not shock your intestinal system. So eat five to six small meals per day rather than three large ones. Um, avoid foods that are spicy, fried or greasy, or foods with very strong odors. Um, people also find that strong uh, uh, perfume can also trigger nausea in some situations. Eat, choose foods that are cool or warm. Again, not hot or cold. What you don't want to do is stimulate the nerves within your um, gastrointestinal system because that will often um, trigger a bout of nausea. Eat 
if your um, medications, whatever they're prescribed or whatever is recommended is not effective, you should also write that down. It's um, often um, just as important of knowing uh, what works for you to know what doesn't work because we have a sort of menu of things that we would try in sequence, but if you found that you know, you've gone through the first two or three options, um, it's very helpful to let your healthcare provider know that up front so they can move on to another option that you have not yet tried. Um, sitting, sit, sticking with the GI tract uh, constipation. Again, some cancer treatments can cause constipation. Um, pain medication also can cause constipation. What can you do to avoid it? Remain hydrated, uh, eight to 12 glasses of water or other fluids a day that do not contain caffeine. Stay active. Um, the the uh, GI system works best when you're upright, when you're supine, um, uh, laying down or sitting. Uh, the peristalsis, which is the, the movement that moves the contents of your bowel along uh, is less effective. You check it with your doctor about adding fiber to your diet, whole grain breads and cereals, beans, raw vegetables, all will help. If you've not had a bowel movement in two days or have abdominal pain, talk to your doctor um, or nurse, okay? So again, with the GI tract, diarrhea, um, some of the medication we prescribe can certainly cause um, diarrhea, but diarrhea may also be due to infections. So call your doctor if you experience four um, unexpected episodes of diarrhea in a day. Now, I put it unexpected because some medications that we prescribe um, we know will cause uh, diarrhea. And uh, it's not surprising if you do develop it. What is an issue is if you develop diarrhea that is not anticipated, which we didn't tell you would occur, that's when you should really uh, pick up the phone and call in. Some treatments, for instance, immunotherapy is not supposed to cause diarrhea. And if it, you are getting diarrhea on immunotherapy, we would um, be very interested in hearing about that sooner rather than later. So anything that's unexpected in general, check with the, uh, your healthcare team um, and particularly so with uh, diarrhea. You should um, clear it with us before you start any medications uh, to counteract your diarrhea. Again, drink plenty of fluids, sports drinks. If you have diarrhea, again, uh, sticking with the idea of not interrupting your skin surface if you can, um, you know, wipe gently after bowel movements to avoid uh, injury and introducing bacteria. What should you eat? Uh, eat small frequent meals, low fiber foods, um, and follow the brat diet, bananas, white rice, apple so apples, applesauce, toast. What should you avoid if you have uh, diarrhea? Uh, very hot or very cold drinks, caffeine products or alcoholic beverages, and spicy, greasy or fried foods. Uh, milk and milk products are a big uh, contributor as well. You'll have more difficulty um, digesting uh, um, lactose, gas-producing foods like cabbage, broccoli, and soy. Pain. Um, unfortunately, pain can be a component of your um, pathway through treatment of your cancer. Um, cancer can cause pain or pain can be a side effect of cancer treatment. For instance, some of the medications we use to boost your immune system can cause achiness. Uh, pain does not always mean that the cancer is getting worse. Um, again, some of the treatments we use can cause uh, achiness in joints. Uh, and uh, some people, uh, some patients describe a dull ache in their cancer after chemotherapy as well. Probably a reaction to the medication. The appropriate management, most pain can be controlled. <clears throat> in general, there's a low likelihood dependence of uh, addiction to pain medication when taken as prescribed and you actually have pain. Um, I know many people are concerned about um, uh, addiction. Uh, you know, if that is your concern and it's the reason you don't want to take the pain medication, let your uh, um, healthcare team know and see if they can find alternatives. But at some point, you may, just, you may need uh, medication to control your symptom because other means may not be uh, effective. 
go through this quickly, um, running out of time. Uh, be specific when describing your symptoms, um, where the pain, what word best describes it, sharp, achy, dull, burning, or throbbing. It helps us get a sense as to what actually might be causing the problem. And is the pain always is the pain always there? Does it come and go? And what makes it better or worse? Um, you'll often be asked to rate um, your pain on a scale of uh, zero, which is no pain, to ten, which is the worst pain you've had. Again, it allows us to quantify uh, the response that you're having to an intervention that we might recommend. Generally, take the pain medication as uh, prescribed. Avoid skipping doses. For instance, um, there's some long-acting pain relievers that are given um, to be taken once every 12 hours, which is not twice a day. So once every 12 hours means you should schedule to take the medication once every 12 hours um, using a clock, not just taking it in the morning and in the evening. That way you can maintain an adequate amount of the pain reliever in your system without having these peaks and uh, valleys where the pain's there, then it goes away and it comes back because the amount of pain medication in your system has, has decreased. Once you lose control of your pain, uh, it becomes more difficult to control in the future. So don't wait until the pain is out of control to take your medication. It's important to stay ahead of your discomfort instead of reacting to it. Do not increase or decrease the, your prescribed medication on your own. Call your doctor before you do and share it with them. If you're taking an opioid medication, talk to your doctor about uh, constipation. They often cause it. Xerostomia is dry mouth. Um, we'll go a little faster. Uh, sip water throughout the day. You can use sugar-free candies, sugar-free gum. There are saliva substitutes, um, which can be used in, uh, in some uh, circumstances. Use sauces or gravy to make food easier to swallow. There can be changes in taste and smell. Um, these are often temporary. If it's affecting your ability to eat, ask your doctor about referral to a nutritionist. Um, the reason this occurs is the uh, nerves that provide uh, sensation of smell um, and taste come out from the base of the brain. And with treatment, the little um, extensions of the nerves that provide the sensing can retract and they, they will often grow back with time. So this will often come back or not all the nerves are affected equally. And so you'll find that, uh, you know, you'll get a metallic taste in food or when you're eating, it's more comfortable to eat with plastic utensils rather than uh, metal ones. And then just various little tricks that we can be used to, to get around some of these problems. <clears throat> just ask your uh, healthcare team. Uh, hair loss, finally, not all treatments cause hair loss. Um, Ask your doctor or nurse if your treatment typically causes hair loss. Hair loss is often temporary. The hair normally grows back after discontinuation of treatment. Many insurance companies will actually provide you uh, coverage for a wig. Um, if you plan to use a wig, um, make your selection before you lose your hair. That way you can transition sort of seamlessly in your social group, or you can have you know all of your hair loss occur and then purchase a wig. But uh, uh, most individuals who care about this will want it done beforehand. Um, one last thing about hair loss, there's something called cold cap therapy. Um, when used during chemotherapy, it significantly decreases hair loss. The idea is you chill the scalp with a uh, form-fitting cap that can be cooled to 32 degrees. The cold causes the blood vessels to con uh, in the scalp to constrict, and therefore the hair follicles are exposed to less uh, chemotherapy, and it is associated with a significant improvement in maintaining your hair and preventing uh, hair loss. There are some downsides to it. One is the cost. The, each um, cap is purchased, and so there's a charge for um, the cap itself, and then there's a charge for each use. And it does add considerable time to chemotherapy. You have to put the cap on 30 minutes beforehand and uh, then for about an hour and a half after each treatment to get the full effect. And this is um, what it looks like. And this uh, uh, tube here brings the uh, cool liquid that chills your scalp. It is effective, but you know, we're, um, we do have it available. However, use is restricted because it increases chair time and um, uh, 
uh, amount of time you're spending in the office. And because of the pandemic, we're, we like to keep people moving through the office relatively quickly. It can be used though, if it is not going to increase the amount of time you're in the office. And the way that would work is uh, while you're receiving your treatment, not everything is chemotherapy. You only, you only need to co-cap on when you're receiving chemotherapy. So if some of your medications that you're receiving IV or fluids or electrolytes or uh, medications such as immune therapy that does not cause hair loss, you can use your cold cap while your chemo is being administered. And while the other drugs are being administered, um, you can get the benefit of the, the cold cap. Anyway, that's a, it's an option that is there if you're um, uh, interested and can meet the criteria to use it. All right, so additional resources for side effect and symptom management. Um, the standard medications for symptom management can be combined with complementary and alternative medicine. And that would be nutrition, exercise, relaxation techniques, acupuncture, chiropractor. Um, you can ask your healthcare provider which of these is appropriate for you and which they would recommend or not recommend. Um, just talk with your doctor or nurse to see if these services are appropriate in your situation. Okay. okay, so um, we probably don't have time to answer live questions that pop into the chat, um, but we do have some uh, previously sent in questions. Uh, Dr. Uh, Reed and Dr. Lee, would you be able to just answer those questions? Sure. Okay. Um, Dr. Lee, I think there were some for radiation. Mm -hmm. So is radiation recommended for people with many autoimmune diseases and lupus-like photosensitivities? Um, well, so autoimmune diseases and um, uh, connective tissue disorders, they can sometimes increase the severity of side effects that we see. Uh, but for something like lupus, the, the vast majority of the modern data shows pretty good um, treatment tolerance with radiation. Um, things like scleroderma, uh, they tend to have much more severe side effects. So we, we think more critically about that. Um, but, but certainly people who are more sensitive, um, we do take that into consideration when making our uh, recommendations. Okay. And then what nutrition and dietary supplements are recommended for women following a lumpectomy prior and during radiation and chemotherapy? What foods and supplements should be avoided? So during radiation, we, um, we usually give the advice to stay away from high doses of antioxidants. And uh, one of the reasons why we do that is theoretically, it could counteract the way that the radiation works um, by providing sort of an antioxidant buffer to get rid of some of that free radical damage that radiation does in cancer cells. But if it's really, if we're just talking about a regular multivitamin, that's completely okay to continue uh, during the radiation. It's really just the very, very high doses of things like vitamin C uh, that we tell patients maybe, you know, hold off until after you finish. Uh, Food-wise, really no big restrictions. Okay. All right. So thank you, Dr. Lee and Dr. Reed for taking the time to present on this topic and to answer our questions. And the next topic in this series is hematologic malignancies on Friday, October 30th at noon. And thank you everyone for joining us for today's talk and take care and stay safe. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for joining us for this week's Encore presentation. To join us for live programs, or to learn more about the East Brunswick Public Library, visit our website at ebpl.org.